I think it's very clear that um, we are moving towards a new system that incorporates gold. So I don't know if the uh, gold price will actually reach 20,000, but we'll go over 5,000, probably over 10,000. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, August 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, August 30th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified of new updates, and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we really do appreciate your support and thank you for it. Jan Neuenhaus is our guest today, a precious metals analyst with Boima Gold. In particular, Jan is well known for his articles regarding the Chinese gold market, central banks, gold policies, and the international monetary system. And we're delighted to have Jan back here today as a return guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Jan Neuenhaus. Jan, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thanks for having me uh, again. We're glad you uh, had time to to make a return trip. Uh, Jan, the rise in the price of gold has been pretty spectacular recently, and it went on to reach new all-time highs. What are the factors lighting the fuel of the gold rocket right now? Is it due to current events, or is it more of a type of a cyclical move after a bear market? Well, I think the, the most obvious thing I look at is real interest rates, uh, interest rates uh, in the U.S. So that's the the tightest correlation I see with uh, gold, and I also think there's a causation in there. So if you look at the 10-year real interest rates uh, from the U.S. and the price of gold in U.S. dollars, that's very tightly correlated for for years now. It was also uh, we also saw this correlation in the 1970s. So this is really a driving factor in um, in the price of gold. Now, of course, these real interest rates have become negative now. So uh, just like in 2011, so we see this spike in gold. And this is how much of the institutional uh, money is uh, valuing uh, gold. So that is a, a, a big driver in the price of gold. I don't exclude that this correlation, I think the correlation will hold, but the the the, the distance between the, the, the lines on the chart um, may, may become wider. So it can be that this correlation will change in the sense that gold will move up more rapidly than uh, real interest rates fall because I really think that gold is very much undervalued uh, actually. Okay. You know, one of the, the things I'm interested to find out is the longevity of the current gold bull market. And one key to understand the longevity, I I, I suppose, is to understand uh, where the bull market actually began. So in your opinion, where do you feel that the, the gold bull market actually began? It slowly began in 2015. I mean, I look at uh, I look at always from the perspective of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. So it's makes the most sense to look at the uh, gold situation uh, from the US dollar perspective. And it's the, the bottom was in, in 2015 and slowly uh, started to creep up uh, from there. It really took off in 2019 and that's when, um, you know, we entered a new phase. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we now you have all these phases, of course, in a bull market. We now get a little bit of media attention, but uh, we'll uh, there's there's a lot more room and time for this bull market. Uh, there hasn't been any cab driver telling me to buy gold mining stocks or my mother asking me, while well, she knows I'm, I'm a gold analyst, asking me anything about gold. So um, uh, there's still, still a long way um, ahead of us, aside from these anecdotal jokes. Um, the big problem is, of course, um, the debt overhang in the system. I mean, it's just staggering how much debt is being. There was pre-corona was we had a lot of debt in the system and it was unsustainable. But now after Corona, it just um, it's, you know, uh, countries like the U.S. or Italy or many others. 
they can never, you know, it's not about uh, repaying the debt because debt always needs to be refinanced in, you know, government debt. But if it's sustainable and, uh, for example, if you see now at the U.S., the debt is not sustainable, right? So that's a huge problem. And uh, it will most likely be, uh, the debt burden will most likely be um, lowered through um, inflation because that is what has happened uh, for centuries. And um, that will be, yeah, very bullish for the price of gold. I, I, I can, uh, yeah, some people are talking about, you know, 2,000, 3,000. I see it going much higher, actually, because so much money has been printed, which has gone into financial assets. Those are in a bubble and those bubbles have also, you know, low interest rate environment have also destroyed the economy, uh, destroyed productivity, uh, increased inequality. So if those bubbles collapse and you get a, let's say, a flight from uh, from uh, currency because uh, it can go um, into, uh, let's say, commodities, goods and services. Gold will rise significantly. All this extra money that has been used to stimulate the economy uh, can come, uh, let's say, home into into uh, commodities, goods, services, and gold, and then it will rise um, quite a lot. Yeah, completely agree with you there. You mentioned your mom. Is she a is she a gold bug? Have you convinced her? Have you gotten her to buy some gold, or she's just wondering what are you doing still? She's absolutely no gold bug. I've been trying to uh, <laughs> tell her about gold for ten years, but she doesn't understand, and uh, she didn't. Uh, she she doesn't own uh, gold. Every time uh, the silver price goes up, she she's asking me uh, if she she should sell her uh, silver coin she inherited from her grandma or whatever. And I'm saying wait it's not the time uh now i mean there's a lot more room uh, for precious metals yeah okay well we'll have to get mom on one of these days huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well they're not my mom she's really not she's not uh, clever with economics but some other moms are really uh, interesting or just you know some of these people around you are really interesting to to go a sentiment among just average people because i can remember like 15 years ago i was not working in this field and i didn't have a clue about economics. You didn't follow it. And uh, you really, you know, maybe you can remember in 2017 that a lot of people maybe around you were, were telling you about Bitcoin. And, and then you really know that something is in a bubble. And uh, so it's really interesting to, uh, yeah, to talk to, let's say, average people about uh, finance. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, you mentioned um, gold and price moving up. How high could the gold price go in this bull market, in your opinion? I think very high, actually. I just, yesterday, um, not to be a hyperbole or whatever, I mean, just just um, speaking my thought. Um, yesterday, I uh, looked at some data and uh, I plotted, the made a chart, and I plotted the Fed's monetary base and the value of the uh, US monetary uh, gold stock. So what happened in the 1920s is that um, the value of the US gold was lower than the uh, US monetary base. And then in the 1930s, the value of the US monetary gold, uh, also because the price increased, reached the, uh, the US monetary base and it fell down again. But in 1980, at the peak, of the bull market, um, the value of the U.S. monetary stock again reached equal to the U.S. monetary base. And what we see now is that there's a big gap still between um, uh, the value of the U.S. monetary gold and the U.S. Uh, monetary base. And I calculated that if the gold price uh, would cause the U.S. monetary gold stock to equal uh, the value, equal the U.S. monetary uh, base, it should be uh, eighteen thousand uh, dollars per troy ounce. So I'm not saying, and of course the Fed keep keeps on printing. So um, I don't know if it will reach uh, twenty thousand. Uh, so it's a moving target. I'm saying. So I don't know if the uh, gold price will actually reach twenty thousand, but I'm 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 thinking really in the it will. 
we'll go over 5,000, probably over 10,000. Yeah, I think that's very, very likely. Jan, it, it should be obvious, though, by now that uh, record levels of debt are impossible to be repaid based on current conditions. If we were to even consider repayment as a possibility, something different and drastic has to has to happen. Do you think one possible option is for gold to be revalued higher, just as we said, to account for record levels of debt in the system? Do you feel that uh, the governments or central banks may actually may actually do it? Yeah, it could be. It could be. Um, I did some uh, research. It was kind of. Um Interesting. I uh, researched the, the balance sheets of the European uh, central banks, and um, especially the. Uh, I looked at the, the biggest one, also of course my my own uh, central bank, the Dutch central bank, but also the German central bank, France and and Italy. And what they do is um, they they have the gold on the asset side, and on the liability side they have a, what's called a revaluation account. So that is the the unrealized gains in uh, in in gold uh, in the gold value. Uh, of course, they purchased gold at a certain amount, and it went up in value. And uh, all that gain is on the liability side of their uh, balance sheet. And they say in the in the annual reports that uh, part on the liability side is actually a buffer, a shock buffer to let um to uh have um, um uh, for example if they have a lot of losses on on assets they can um absorb those losses with this buffer with this they call it hidden gold reserves this is sorry i'm, I'm getting into accounting uh, technical details okay. but let me put it very clearly um the, the gold on the balance sheet of central banks uh, if they if it, if it increases in value what happens is that um, it can make up for the losses of other set, uh, assets on their uh, balance sheet. So, um, of course, central banks are buying a lot of bonds. And if those bonds uh, decline in, in value, they have to, you know, they suffer losses on their balance sheet. So increasing the price of gold then uh, repairs their balance sheet. The higher the gold price goes, the more, um, you know, the wealthier or the, the more uh, uh, value is, is uh, accumulated on their balance sheet so they can absorb more losses. Uh, this is a different story than what I just told about the Fed's monetary base and uh, the price of gold up there. That's another uh, model, but yeah, it's it's very likely because you know as you can see now the the, the Fed, but also in in Europe the, the European Central Bank is buying a lot of Italian bonds. I mean the country is is technically uh, bankrupt, and uh, the the ECB keeps buying these these bonds. Now of course they will suffer losses at some point, and uh, they have to do something. And I think gold will be be used in 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 that problem. Okay, so I guess. Uh... Is it fair to say that central banks actually do like gold? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Uh, I think, you know, I, I still, of course, I, I read a lot about gold, um, uh, predominantly uh, on the Internet because the, the newspapers don't write about gold. <laughs> and I see still a lot of uh, articles uh, from from commentators about that central banks hate gold and they uh, discourage people to buy gold. But you know, from my, I think this is a bit of an old narrative they got stuck in because uh, if you look at, and I've written about this, if you look, for example, on the websites of the European Central Banks, they're very pro-gold and they're stimulating uh, actually people to buy gold. Uh, they're promoting gold. And it's the same, of course, in Asia. I mean, you know, the Russian Central Bank or the Chinese Central Bank, or they're all very much pushing gold also, of course, to to counter the dollar hegemony. Um, the US uh, central bank, the Federal Reserve, isn't uh, very much pro-gold. I mean, they're not promoting gold yet, but we also see sentiment changing. I mean, uh, maybe uh, Judy Shelton is uh, is coming on the board of the, the Federal Reserve, and she's a, let's say, gold buck or pro-gold standard. So even there, we see um, a change in, 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 say, sentiment. And it's only logic, you know, if you if you start with a purely fiat uh, monetary system and eventually, uh, you know, uh, you print too much money, which always happens because it's politically too tempting to always 
counter a crisis by printing more money and lowering interest rates, eventually you reach the end of the system. Everything get, gets, uh, gets uh, distorted. Everything's, uh, everything uh, turns into financial mush. And of course, the topic of gold uh, comes up again because it's, 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 uh, it's a fallback uh, currency um, to restore uh, trust in the system. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're touching a bit on, um, on Europe. You wrote in a recent article titled, Europe has been preparing for a, gold, a global gold standard since the 1970s, in which you did a, you did a great job putting together developments such as uh, the gold repatriations from European nations and also what looks like um, the change in perspective of European central banks about, about gold, as we, just, as we just touched on. But first, I, I want to ask you, why do you believe that Europe has been preparing for a gold standard? Or a global gold standard since 1970 and how, or the 70s, and how can you be sure that this was a development that started 50 years ago and not only, let's say, in the last decade? That's a good question, and uh, I also wrote, you know, this is this was this was a very complex analysis to write about, and I also wrote somewhere in the in the article that. Uh, of course, first you need a headline for the for the article, and you the headline sort of has to uh, be a summary of what you want to say. And I also said gold standard, but um, I'm not sure what kind of uh, new system it will be. But I think it will incorporate gold. Maybe it's not on a fixed parity. Maybe it's not a classical gold standard, but a new system. But anyway, um, a new system that uh, incorporates gold. Then your second question was. Um, about how did I know if they started in the 1970s and worked all the way through now on the same idea? Um, I don't, and I don't think, that's also what I wrote in the article, I don't think that they had, had a clear-cut um, idea in the 1970s and worked through the decades to achieve that. I think that uh, also because there wasn't unity in Europe in the 1970s, and there's still not unity uh, in Europe, I mean, we have a common currency, but we're still just, you know, 17 uh, different countries and uh, with all different democracies uh, and stuff. But um, what I try to show in the article is uh, different phases that uh, Europe went through. So let's go through these uh, decades. So first you had the 1970s. The U.S. went off the gold standard. They closed the gold window in 1971. And Europe was not amused. Uh, you had, for example, uh, surplus countries such as uh, Germany, which had a lot of uh, dollar reserves, and those dollars were uh, devalued against gold. So um, obviously they were not amused. Uh, they were also afraid that uh, the Americans would impose the dollar standard on the world, which wouldn't be a fair system and which, which would give the uh, the Americans uh, unprecedented power. Uh, that happened, but you know, Europe was was fighting against this in the 1970s, and there was a diplomatic battle in um, in the 1970s about where the international monetary system should go. And we know from historical documents that have been released in in uh, recent years that Europe was very much in favor of bringing gold back into the system, and mainly France was uh, had that um, opinion. It wasn't a secret at the time because France was very vocal about uh, gold. But we can read in these documents that there were also some other European countries supporting um, France. So we know that in the 1970s there was sentiment in Europe pro-gold to counter dollar uh, dominance. And it was one of the reasons that um, also the euro uh, was launched uh, to compete with the dollar. Uh, so that happened in the 1970s, of course, of maybe you know that um, when uh, the London gold pool collapsed in 1968, there was a, a two-tier system uh, was was imposed. I don't know if you know this, but so in the free market, the gold price was allowed to float, but the official price of gold for central banks was, was kept at $35. So there was a two-tier system. You know, the official price of gold, uh, the gold price, uh, which central banks traded gold in was $35. Uh, eventually, it was raised to $42. And in the free market, um, the, the the gold price was free to uh, float. And the, uh, the deal between central banks was, okay, we don't 
uh, buy gold from each other and then sell it in a free market because it, you know, would would make considerable uh, profit. Um, but this was in the advantage of the U.S. The U.S. wanted to demonetize gold, so they wanted to keep the official price of gold low, and you know, uh, through that, keep it out of the, uh, let's say, international monetary system, so you can't really use it. I mean, no central bank was 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 selling its gold at forty two uh, dollars uh, an ounce in the nineteen seventies because they could see live, you know, in the newspaper back then that the real price was much higher. So the Europeans was uh, were uh, were trying to get rid of the two tier system. That happened in nineteen seventy eight. What the Europeans then did was the first step towards monetary integration, and they launched the European monetary system. I know this is a complicated story, but I'm just going through the decades here. Uh, the European monetary system had a uh, already a, a currency unit, which was called the ECU. And the ECU was in part backed by gold. And it was used to for international settlements, but also to keep the exchange rates between the uh, European currencies uh, stable. Because they were already uh, trying to form a let's say, uh, a common float. So they were trying to fix the parities in um, in Europe between the European currencies and float as a block versus uh, the American dollar to, you know, uh, have unity in Europe. And um, what, what that meant was that they were trying to deploy gold and, and keep it into the system as much as possible. And what actually happened through that European monetary system is that gold was still being used and it provided liquidity in, in, in the gold market. And uh, one of, I like a very good book uh, called uh, The Rules of the Game. Um, this professor says uh, that it was the first step of uh, reintegrating uh, gold into the uh, European, uh, or into, into the uh, uh, international monetary system. Okay. Let's go a bit faster. Then in the 1990s, what Europe uh, did then uh, predominantly was this selling of gold. Now, in 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 uh, you know at the surface you would think, well, selling of gold is 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 is, is not bullish. It's it's you know they're probably selling it because um, they want to get rid of it. They see no value in it. But later on, we discovered that they sold the gold to equalize gold reserves internationally. We know from uh, predominantly the uh, Dutch uh, central bank that gave uh, answers in, 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 uh, in parliament here, that the main reason the Dutch uh, central bank sold gold, and they sold a lot of their gold, about two thirds, is a, it was because they thought they had too much gold in comparison to other important gold holding nations. So um, they were thinking about equalizing gold reserves and uh, a lot of other central banks in Europe did did so as well, like the Swiss and um, Belgium, for example. Some of these medium-sized uh, countries with a lot of gold reserves sold some uh, gold to equalize the reserves uh, relatively to GDP. And if you look at the chart, it turned out quite well. You can see Italy has a little bit too much gold and Spain has a little bit too little, but you know, across the board, it's, it's, it's pretty much equalized in terms of GDP. Uh, uh, you can, of course, uh, compare, um, you know, gold reserves per country. And then should you look at the monetary base or should you look at something else? Well, the monetary base can be inflated uh, indefinitely. So what's real in an economy is GDP. So if you look at the sizes of the economy in terms of GDP and then uh, plot the amount of gold, uh, these countries have, uh, the balance is, is, is quite striking. So, uh, yeah, so that was in the 1990s. Then we fast forward to, um, to after the global financial crisis. So these are all clues that, that Europe was still very much in favor of gold. And they always had in the back of their minds um, reintroducing gold into the monetary system. And then after the great financial crisis, a few things happened. Uh, first of all, they started repatriating gold. They started upgrading their gold, you know, to current wholesale industry standards to make it liquid. Uh, and also they started drastically changing the way they communica uh, communicate about gold. 
So, for example, on the Dutch uh, central bank website, also the German central bank, Italian central bank, French central bank, uh, they are promoting gold. If you read now on the Italian central bank website, they are saying that gold is very is a very good uh, hedge against adversity and also uh, high inflation. And they say because gold isn't issued by a government or central bank, so it's really independent. So this is a central bank. Their main task is, uh, you know, is to uh, is to protect financial stability. They issue their own currency, but what they say is that gold is a superior currency to their currency, and they're warning the public against high inflation, and that gold is an excellent hedge against that inflation. Uh, so this is this is very shocking to me, and. Um, of course, you know, um, journalists from, from newspapers do not read these um, uh, web pages and don't pick this up. But if you put this uh, together, I think it's very clear that uh, that that some big changes are uh, in front of us. And um, if you can read the signs, I think it's very clear that um, we are moving towards a new system that incorporates gold, not only because of what I everything I just told, but also because of logic and because of the massive debt we we now have and, and, and the bubbles in, in asset markets that um, that that must uh, implode at one point and and, and then um, uh, a new trust anchor needs to be uh, imposed. Okay, so there's sort of a, throughout Europe, they're sort of trying to um, equalize gold or I guess the, the distribution of, of gold uh, as a step towards a new type of a, a gold standard. Yeah, sorry. Thanks for 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 saying that because maybe I didn't say it in my previous answer. So if you want to go back to uh, a gold standard, you know, and, and gold standard can mean a, a lot of things. I'm just using this term as a you know for a lot of setups with with gold. If you go to a gold standard with the whole world, of course, the chips of the new game, the gold, has to be uh, distributed evenly. You know, because if you go back to a gold standard and only the West, let's say uh, Europe and uh, the US have all the gold, there wouldn't be an equitable and durable system. So what uh, what happened is when um, when Europe uh, sold their gold and it was not that. Uh, so the, the, the country that had, that had relatively too much gold, they sold it. There was in part bought by by Asian central banks or by Asian uh, individuals like Indian housewives or Chinese people or etc. So uh, it was kind of stimulating to equalize uh, gold reserves across the world. So and it's pretty striking now if you look at certain metrics uh, that the gold is pretty evenly distributed uh, across the world, which is a good foundation for for a new system that incorporates uh, gold yeah okay so how equalized are the gold reserves of central banks in europe today and and is this plan still working or still being drawn out it's pretty pretty equalized uh i just had a look at the data again and uh i have to say i use gdp numbers from pre-corona and as you know in corona uh you know in this crisis the gdp numbers are uh are, are, are varying. Uh, for example, in Finland, uh, GDP collapsed by only 4%, but in Spain, it was above 10%. So, but anyway, if I use pre-corona GDP levels, it's pretty well equalized the gold reserves uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, like I said, Italy has a little bit too much gold. Spain has a little bit too little. Swiss, uh, Switzerland, which isn't part of the uh, Eurozone, but is part of the um, yeah, the Washington Agreement, which was the program in which European Central Bank uh, in concert sold gold. Uh, Switzerland has a little bit too much, but uh, it's pretty well uh, equalized. Yeah. So uh, in that uh, in that sense, uh, it's 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 um, it's looking good. OK. Uh, countries like Italy, I think they still do have a lot of their gold um, outside of Italy. Are these these countries going to have to repatriate their their gold? Yeah, well, um, that's a very good, uh, it's a very nice question. I think uh, they will need to repatriate more. Um, 
I was just thinking about this the other day, and uh, as you know, the political ties between between Germany and the U.S. have severely deteriorated uh, in the past um, years. You know, when Trump came in office, they he immediately started attacking Europe for not paying enough to NATO. Then they sanctioned Europe over uh, Nord Stream 2, which is a gas pipeline from Russia to uh, Europe. Now, you know, Europe and the U.S. Uh, were, were, were allies, uh, you know, in the past. And um, so there, these political ties are are, uh, are are terrible at the moment. So what I think uh, Germany is now doing, they're waiting for the elections uh, in the U.S. If Trump gets re-elected, I think Germany may repatriate all their gold, or it could repatriate all their gold because you get a similar conflict between uh, the U.S. and China, right? This, this trade conflict. And it's it's about how many weapons do you have and what the U.S. can do and what they have done in the past. For example, in 1979, uh, the U.S. had a had a conflict with Iran and they froze their gold account at, uh, at the New York Fed. So, of course, this is um, if Europe has gold laying in New York, the U.S. has leverage over those European countries. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it would be a very, it would be a nuclear option for European uh, countries to repatriate all their gold, but it would provide safety because you do not want, you know, the US, U.S. to say, well, we're blocking your account and, you know, you can't, uh, can't access your gold. So I think, um, but, but the global trend is, is less, um, less cooperation in, in uh, less globalization, right, in, in recent years. So maybe even if, if, if Biden becomes president, the same thing, the same trend will, will develop and uh, Europe will uh, repatriate more gold as well. Uh, the, the, the factors here for the central banks are security versus uh, liquidity. If you have um, gold stored in for example, in New York or in London, it provides liquidity because that's a gold trading hub. But it isn't secure because other countries may uh, freeze your uh, gold. So this is the trade-off. And uh, but it will be fascinating to see if Europe uh, will repatriate uh, more gold. Yeah, I mean this is a pretty interesting dynamic. Being uh, these countries are all traditional allies. Um, in the past, European nations saw the storing of gold abroad as a Astute diversification move to mitigate possible invasions by by enemies and by repatriating more gold back home or homeward can we conclude that the the risks of a currency crisis now outweighs the risks of military conflicts within within Europe yeah of course I mean I, I think there is very little uh risk of military conflict in uh, Europe. I don't think that Russia is 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 that stupid to invade Europe. Uh, so uh, it's all about, um, yeah, uh, and it, I, I agree with you. I think the, 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 the risk for currency crisis is much greater. Also bear in mind that uh, the US is now withdrawing troops from uh, Germany. So, uh, and that was in, in uh, the 1970s, there was a reason uh, the U.S. was blackmailing uh, Germany in uh, the 1970s not to redeem any dollars for gold or it would withdraw its troops from, from Germany. And now the U.S. is withdrawing troops from Germany. So Germany is really, well, OK, then we you know we're going to we're, we're going to back off of the dollar uh, uh, as well now. So, uh, yeah, I think this the, 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 the gold is a very good barometer for these developments. OK. So obviously the, the central banks, they, they have to talk with each other to, to coordinate this plan. Um, how likely do you think that these that the European central bankers have met in secret to discuss laying the groundwork for this possible new type of gold standard? Very good question. I'm glad you asked because I also forgot to mention uh, something. And that is that in uh, before I published the, uh, the article about European having prepared a new global gold standard uh, since the 1970s, I asked one of the ex-central bankers uh, of a Euro European central bank in uh, Europe. And I asked this person, well, uh, I, I know him, he follows me on Twitter and I follow him. And 
I, I said to him, I found a lot of uh, evidence and I find it just so striking that, uh, you know, the Dutch Central Bank uh, said, for example, that they uh, sold gold to equalize reserves or that's my conclusion. And, and I asked him, did you know about this policy and could you maybe uh, share something about this? And he said, yeah, well, I knew about this, but I can't talk about it because it's uh, confidential. So, and I encountered this on many occasions that, um, you know, what an NDA is, right? A non-disclosure agreement. So central bankers and ex-central bankers can talk about a lot of things about monetary policy with, you know, with euros and buying bonds and interest rates and everything, but they are not allowed to talk about gold, uh, gold policy. I mean, they can say the gold price is this or that today, but they are not allowed to, to, to talk about their uh, gold policy uh, at the central bank. So that really gave me um, a good idea about, you know, because we hear so little from central banks, of course, about this. And we, my analysis is really based on all these breadcrumbs I found along the way. So, um, of course, uh, this also has to do with, you know, since the 1970s, central bankers have replaced each other. I mean, there has, hasn't been a central banker in office since the 1970s. So this has been an ongoing thing. So, but I think they they all shared the sentiment and, uh, of course they all talk to each other, not in secret, but just in private. Uh, I just read a, a book from, uh, it was a Dutch uh, gentleman. He was the ex-president of the uh, uh, BIS, actually. And then in his memoirs, uh, he talks about, you know, how how did, how he discussed about certain things uh, in private with with other central bankers, not only at the BIS, you know, in his meetings, but also, you know, in in private conversations. And of course, these gold was discussed as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think they for certain uh, discuss these these gold policies and um, but they haven't uh, been quite honest uh, about it. And um, because obviously if if a central banker, for example, will, now things are changing, but if they would have talked about uh, gold policy or the importance of gold in the 1990s or let's say in 2003, that would that would cause a shock through the monetary system. Right. So. It takes a very gradual approach to 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 do this. Yeah. Okay. So, so help us understand this. I mean, we have governments, central banks, um, introducing things like bail-ins, QE, uh, quantitative easing, things like negative interest rates, and and now here we are. I guess supposedly these things aren't working out too well, and now they're looking at, at gold as a possible answer to a new monetary system. How did we get from from there to here? Yeah, it's a good question. What I think is that um, because you would think that, well, why don't they do it now? I mean, obviously, the policy now, what they do isn't working. Why don't they shift to a gold standard now? The thing is that uh, it has to do with, first of all, the, I think Europe wanted to equalize uh, reserves and they wanted to uh, wanted Asia to catch up. And so you have a multipolar world where where you have not one center of power, but you have multiple centers of power that uh have more balance uh but also you have this if one country for example if europe would go on a gold standard right now just hypothetically of course their currency would become very uh expensive appreciate and that would hurt their uh, exports so they uh, keep on playing this game with all the consequences on, until you know everybody really has reached the bottom and also maybe that uh, that inflation has eroded uh, all the debt, and then you can really start off with a new system, and everybody at the same time um, moves to a new system. Now I'm not saying this will be orchestrated uh, top down. It can also just develop organically. Uh, these are really, really complicated things, but uh, that is, I think, one of the reasons that. Um, for example, Europe or China is not saying we're going on the gold standard right now because their currency would appreciate and that would hurt our trade uh, balance. So, um, yeah, it seems they're all going a little bit more off the cliff altogether. And, and when the shit hits the fan, sorry for my French, uh -huh. uh, it's very clear that that something has to be done and also to regain confidence then 
uh, towards the uh, population and uh, they have to come up with uh, with a new system and uh, that's when I think um, a new system that incorporates gold uh, will surface. Yeah, and the gold standard is known to force governments to spend within their budgets versus unconstrained spending that we see now. Why would lawmakers who have been accustomed to spending largesse with debt and money printing for decades want to be constrained with a gold standard? Because they have to. Um, you know, this, the thing of... Um, uh, printing a lot of currency is 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 devastating. It destroys the economy. It destroys the financial markets. I mean, uh, it decreases productivity. It provides the wrong incentives. It increases inequality. What you see now, for example, in the U.S. is social unrest. And a lot of people, of course, uh, they say it's about racism. But a lot of that is also about uh, inequality caused by um, uh, by the central banks. I mean, a lot of it, you know, I prefer not to talk about uh, the, the issue now in the U.S., but a lot of it is, is, is about inequality between classes and not so much about skin color. Um, so um, to restore all, uh, all that, to, to, um, um, uh, because, you know, you can see now that also because of Corona and there, there is a lot of. Uh, social unrest developing um, uh, across the globe and a lot of distrust against governments and to restore that trust and to, you know, uh, to restore uh, social rest, so to say, uh, you have to come up with a really solid uh, monetary plan and uh, gold is very suitable for that, uh, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's pretty interesting what you said, because when we when we go back and we look at the, the situation of what happened in, in Hong Kong, you had people there. Um, protesting uh they they wanted freedoms and things like that but underlying that was really the elements where people there were unhappy because they a lot could not afford home prices and i think this is possibly the same situation in the u.s as you touched on with the, the inequalities going on yeah yeah and and for example i mean it, it, it's so clear right i mean uh we all know that maybe you know this website it's called uh, wtf happened in 1971 uh, which has, <laughs> and it stands for, uh, but it has all these charts that show this these huge differences or the, these huge social and economic changes uh, changes since 1971, and uh, inequality has has drastically uh, widened uh, since uh, we left the gold standard, um, and the Hong Kong situation is a good example, uh, U.S. also, but. Bear in mind, pre-corona, we had the yellow vests in France. And the main reason why they started demonstrating, because diesel, uh, the price of diesel was raised by, I believe, 10 or 20 cents per liter. So only that was uh, making the population furious or population, the, let's say, the lower class, which really is hurt by these small things. So, you know, if, if uh, and that's only... That, that, that's a little thing, right? If, if diesel gets is, is priced higher by, by 10 cents. Now, what happens if, you know, if we, we, we get 10% inflation and, and like we have now 10 or 15% unemployment without government stimulus or, you know, if, if things go really bad, uh, that's, that's, that's a worrying situation. Yeah, yeah I completely agree with that. Uh, Jan, do you see continued increase in the distrust of the U.S. dollar and the desire to reduce that dependence on the dollar to, to grow in the future? Yeah, I see, I see a lot of, uh, first of all, um, the U.S. has overplayed its hand, right? So um, uh, I think everybody outside the U.S. doesn't like the U.S. dollar. They, they still have to use it because they also, you know, there's a political side to it and they don't like this dollar, but there's also an economic side. So, for example, U.S. Treasuries still have a little bit of yield in it and a lot of other bonds uh, don't. So uh, uh, a lot of those countries still hold uh, U.S. Uh, treasuries. But Europe, uh, Russia, China, they all, a lot of countries want to get rid of, uh, want to get rid of the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar wants to get rid of itself as well. I mean, um, if you read between the lines, uh, you know that a lot of people in the U.S., maybe Trump, maybe Judy Shelton, maybe even advisors of Obama said that, look, 
you know, having the world reserve currency uh, has a lot of benefits because you have a lot of power. But of course, you can just print money and import stuff. But your your manufacturing base, your own industry is collapsing because all the jobs go overseas. And that's why the whole middle class doesn't, you know, is is, is, is so, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, that's why so many people voted for Trump because all their jobs were lost in, in, in the Midland. So it's really unhealthy for a country in the long term to issue the world reserve currency. Uh, this is Triffin's dilemma. Maybe you have uh, heard of it. So if you issue the world reserve currency, you your own manufacturing base uh, will collapse. And that is in long term uh, destroying your own economy as well. So what the U.S. wants is actually what they I think uh, they also slowly want to get rid of their 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 position as world reserve currency. So, um, yeah, that would definitely mean we're going to towards a multi-reserve currency system. Uh, and I think with a, with a great role for gold. I don't know how the, how the uh, future uh, international monetary system will look like, but uh, I think natural forces will move it towards gold anyway. John, before we, we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about yourself and your work at, at Boimo Gold? And of course, what are you going to tell mom? Tell mom. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm. You know, my fascination is is uh, is of course gold, and I, I'm I'm really uh, I look at it uh, from a, from a broad perspective. I zoom out, so I like to know what is the history of gold, and 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 find out. You know, how was uh, how was the classical gold standard, and how was the gold exchange standard, how was Bretton Woods. And then what was what were the existential phases of gold after that and every decade and what happens? And by really uh, uh, thoroughly analyzing that, I hope to get a, a clearer perspective on what the future will bring. So I have more uh, articles planned for that at Voima. Uh, I also recently wrote this this article about the Fed using the gold price to um, for inflation uh, expectations as a, as a measure of inflation expectations in the 1990s and it was actually using the gold price to set monetary policy now all these things are very interesting and um, so I, I just hope to map out more and more about all these i mean it's such a complicated story and I just hope to map out, uh, or I'm I'm working out mapping out all these different segments of of, uh, of the gold market in time, and give people uh, a more clear perspective on on what that might mean for the future. And um, so, yeah. Okay. And um, a little bit about Boima Gold. How's it uh, the new chapter in your life unfolding there? Yeah, pretty good. I like it very much. Um, it's an interesting uh, company. We have a lot of, uh, we invest a lot of uh, money in research and development. So uh, yeah, we have some some great ideas. Um, we want to replace, uh, let's say, regular bank accounts. You know, normal bank accounts have a, a current account and you have a savings account where you don't get any interest on your savings account. And you also uh, have the risk to get uh, bail-ins or uh, you have counterparty risk, of course, the bank can collapse or the money gets inflated. So what we want to offer is a, um, is a let's say, an account where you have uh, euros uh, for your daily payments and a savings account in physical gold without counterparty risk, which offers, of course, an alternative to a regular bank accounts. And then we have a lot more um, uh, of these ideas. So I think it's really, yeah, I'm really excited about these uh, developments. Yeah, New and House, we appreciate the time you've given us and we wish you continued success at Boimo Gold. And as always, we look forward to more of your, your research and work. Thank you very much, Chef. That was Jan New and House, Precious Metals Analyst with Boimo Gold. For more of his insights on the global economy, please visit boimogold.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.